Good evening, everybody. I'm, I think we can make a start, although obviously there are one or two people still trying to join at the moment. Um, my name is Derek Bell. I'm Director of Learners, and it's great pleasure to introduce tonight Steve Baker and Mick Simpson, who we're going to have a conversation with um, as, about their book, School Without Sanctions. Um, the sort of running order that we've planned is that I will open with some questions to Peter and Steve, uh, to Mick and Steve, and we will then have a little conversation between ourselves, which you can join, you can listen to. Please use the Q&A to ask questions that come to your mind at the time as we go along, because after about 35 minutes or so, what we're going to do is to try and open it up um, in order to address your questions and once you know a little bit about the background to the project that we're talking about here. And when I say project, I say that very advisedly because basically it is just a major sea change in the way you might approach discipline and behavioral issues in the school. Um, I think really to start off, I'm going to get Mick and Steve to introduce themselves. But before I do that, I'll just sort of wave the book if you haven't seen it already in front of you. It's um, certainly worth a good read. I was asked to read it in a draft form and then do a comment before they published it. And basically I said that this was more than a book. It was a conversation, a professional conversation and the sort that I think we ought to be having in every school. So really tonight I think is just an extension of that conversation in order to give you an opportunity to be part of it. So with not out any further ado, ado, I will ask Steve Baker OBE to introduce himself and give us a little bit of background of why he got into this project. Thanks very much, Derek. Um, so my name is Steve Baker. I am currently the executive head teacher of two outstanding SEMA schools in Merseyside, a secondary called Kilgarp and a primary called Gilbrook. Um, uh, we originally went about the process to remove punishment uh, and, and sanctions and a punitive approach from Kilgarth School. And that was down to the, the genius of, of the man who'll speak next, Mick Simpson, who was the head of the school at the time. Um, we were very fortunate in, in that and we'll, we'll, we'll dig a little bit deeper as we talk uh, and as the time goes by to have the support of Alice um, Jones, who's from Goldsmiths, who's just joined us on this conversation as well. And Alice gave us the scientific validity to, to support us with that approach. So I'll, I'll pass you over to me. Okay, thanks Steve Baker, OBE. You've got OBE on your screen. <laughs> so my name is Mick Simpson. I'm, uh, I'm currently on my third headship, still feeling like I've got imposter syndrome, I've got to say. And my background was in mainstream education. Uh, for 15 years now, I've been in, uh, in the special SEMH sector. And um, my day job is as a science teacher. And I don't know where we go from here, Steve. I think um, we first met each other, didn't we, uh, at Kilgarth when you were the head, I was the deputy. And um, I don't know, something clicked, I think. And we both realised that we wanted the same thing uh, from our professional and personal lives. And it sounds really corny, but it comes from the heart. We, we both realised that what we wanted was to make life a little bit better for the most marginalised and disadvantaged uh, members of our society. And that just happened to be the, the pupil cohort that was in front of us. And, um, and that's how we first got together and this all started, I think. So that's fascinating. But can we go into some sort of detail about what sort of made you decide that this was an approach worth adopting? Steve, maybe yeah. I'll let you, whoever wishes to start, but what were the things that really started to say, hang on, we need to do something different here? Steve, can I? Yeah, 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 you jump in. So I, I had an epiphany when I was in mainstream and um, it, it came after one hour's training by the, the first person who ever talked to me about the brain and he talked about uh, McLean and triune, um, triune, however you pronounce it, um, reptilian complex. And before that, 
Do you know, I, I was I was the big beast that used to come out of the cage when there was misbehaviour in that. I was the one that people sent for. I was the scary one. And I'd spent 15 years of my professional career basically making sure kids were so frightened that they would do as I asked them to do. And it, it seemed to work. And during that one session, I thought, hang on, it's not working. And started to try and implement a, a compassionate non-confrontational approach and took that with me when I went to uh, to the SEMA sector in Kilgore because it seemed to really fit my way of thinking and the reason that we we started looking at the removal of sanctions was really simple it, it just didn't work I was teaching students and um, using aversive conditioning basically just if, if they uh, showed a behavior that, that wasn't acceptable I punished them and the same kids were getting punished just like they did in mainstream day after day after day and it was producing no effect and, and it worked in in as much as it was really easy to administer and it was really easy for, for, for me to show cause and effect so it worked for the school and it worked for the, for the teachers um, on a surface level but it didn't work for any of the students, it, it absolutely didn't. And worse than that, it, it caused some secondary behaviours that were um, that were sometimes incendiary. So, for, for example, I, I've, had a, I've had a laboratory stool thrown at me for imposing one minute's worth of catch-up, which was our, our version of detention at the time, because it produced such a visceral emotional response and... Um, and the, the, the natural fight behavior that went with it was just very unhelpful. And I could talk about the, the different ways it didn't be for, for the next 30 minutes and use up the entire time that we've got. So I'll, I'll stop there. But it just didn't work for a key, a key cohort of our students. So over 80, maybe 90% of them. Steve, do you want to add? I think mine's a bit more of a, um... I agree and support everything Mick said. My my I came at it from a slightly different angle because of my very unusual background, which I always like to talk about because it, it sort of sets the tone for why I I try and behave the way that I do. So before I came into education, I, I worked for the UN as a war crimes investigator, investigating the Bosnian genocide as a forensic anthropologist. And I, I truly saw the worst that humanity has to offer. And I felt that early intervention and education was the most effective way of trying to prevent something like that ever happening again. And you may think there's a long step um, between challenging behaviour and antisocial behaviour that we might see around us on a day to day basis all the way up to genocide. But, you know, everything starts somewhere. And um, to be honest, what I saw when I came into education um, really supported what I was thinking because what we seem to be doing is reacting to negative behaviour and I wanted to be able to see the child first and the behaviour second and try and base everything that we do on on having positive relationships and you know when when Mick and I had these conversations and uh, and we explored it even further they call it serendipity or fate it, it happened to coincide with the time when I bumped into Alice in London and over a glass of wine, we discussed this. And then um, Alice was really up for a challenge and decided to support us in our approach. Steve, could you just um, introduce Alice a little bit more? There's one, there's a question just come up, you know, somebody wants to know exactly who she is and why she's here. So Alice is here because the more time Mick and I spend with Alice, the better as far as we're concerned, because she's a breath of fresh air and she supports everything that we do. Um, I'm not going to do her justice here, so please forgive me, Alice. Alice is the Director of School and Family Studies at Goldsmiths um, University of London and also the Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Educational Psychology. And her area of expertise, as far as I understand it in my limited way, is around the development of violence and aggression in young people and callous and unemotional traits. And um, I've always, like Mick, my background was in science education um, through pharmacology, biochemistry and forensic anthropology ultimately. But I've always had a real interest in psychology and neuroscience. And then through conversations with, with learners, I, um, I came down to a launch event and um, it sounds absolutely fabulous, but it, um, 
I uh, I bumped into Alice having a glass of wine in the House of Lords. That's not what my life is normally like. But um, we just got talking and Alice spoke ab about the work that she was doing. And um, it just sounded absolutely right up our street. There's a lot of synergy in terms of our, our approach. Alice is absolutely the academic and the brains behind this. And um, Mick and I um, are the practitioners and we wanted to bring the two together. I hope can I've I done add, Alice justice. Can I add? Yeah, go on. I, I would love you to me. As well as uh, as well as uh, just the, the light in our lives when she's around, Alice. It's it's it'll be lovely to talk to you later or see you if we can. We, we were lost because we, we were at a point where we decided the sanctions weren't working. A, a non-confrontational approach was 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 working for us, but um, we. we didn't want to sanction pupils we didn't want to punish them but we didn't know what else to do we we but at a loss we were thinking okay we don't we can see this isn't working but how do we respond to to negative choices and negative behaviors what can we replace it with and we looked on the internet we tried to contact other institutions we didn't know anybody who was doing it already and how we might get some support and then serendipity steve met alice and she provided us with not only um what could replace a sanction but also the, the scientific validity that allowed us to take our staff teams be, and, and without that meeting um we'd still be scratching our heads in birkin heads wondering how to replace sanctions and, and the stuff that we've done whatever have happened so alice thank you so, so is it is it reasonable to say then that the research from two points of view, one is the actual brain structure and function research, plus the work that Alice is doing in terms of the behavioural side and the, if you like, the more psychological approach, that those two coming together with your experience of education, et cetera, are the things that started to really make this project and this idea start to gain, gain some traction. Uh, me again, Steve. Can I please? And uh, uh, absolutely, absolutely. The, the the stuff that we do with um, with other educators and with with the police and the prison service and social workers and other members of the emergency service, the training that, that we offer there is really basic neuroscience. Talking about brain structure. Talking about. Um, uh, McLean's theories about the tree and brain and how they might have evolved over time, talking about the threat response. And really, that's just a, a framework upon which we hope that people will hang their practice, their, their practical solutions to the issues. That, because if we can engage them and trust them, then it's, um, they're, they're much more likely to adopt the, the, the strategies which we think work so well. And, and you know what? They're ready for it. They lap it up. They absolutely lap it up and the, the only issue with that training is that we need um we need senior people senior leadership and going right up to politicians to um to allow the 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 leaders who are interested the freedom to to, to meet strategies in terms of um a compassionate approach that works really well Without, um, without the scientific validity provided by Alice, without the research that she introduced us to, without the, 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 the real um, nuts and bolts that she provided our staff team with and us with, then could not have persuaded anyone to move from sanctions because, um, because it's scary. And uh, if you're going to do something scary and new and embark upon a, a journey, you, you need something to guide you. And the science is what guided us. And Alice, I can see you now. It's, uh, it's lovely to do so. Hello. Hello. It's nice to see you. Everybody knows about Alice. Everybody has seen Alice now. So Alice, welcome to the party. Hi, thank you. Well, just just what given that let's just change the order of things completely let's bring bring you in on the conversation since we've been talking about it. is there anything you would add to this in terms of the research evidence that's actually fed into this before we move on to the um, implementation and the, the issues that have taken place in school yeah i from from my perspective this this whole kind of collaboration really embodies what proper translational research should be about. So I, I have a neuroscience, um, genetics and kind of psychology background. 
um, and I'm not a teacher and I don't spend a lot of time working in schools. Um, so it's it's not really my place to tell teachers how to teach um, or how to run a school because that's not where my expertise is. But what works really well is talking to, to, to teachers, to senior leaders in schools about what they need um, and what their particular challenges are. Um, and, it, and it happens that before I met Steve, I'd worked with a, a CMH primary school and we'd gone through a very similar process. So I had kind of something to, to hang this on. But in, in all cases, it's because some very experienced and very competent um, educators have found that the, um, the profile of the students they're working with has changed over time. And so I think what, what, what I'm able to bring is an idea about, you know, who, who are your students and what are their, what, are, what kind of areas are their needs in? And then to think about focusing interventions that are on those, but also try and explain why things like sanctions don't work um, and why the alternatives would work for everybody. So can we sort of say, well, OK, we've got some big grounding in terms of research evidence. We've got some ideas. Steve, would you like to start to take us through how you set about bringing the change and the implementing the change that you've thought about? So uh, I'll hand over to Mick in a minute because, it, you know, in terms of operationally, he certainly um, was was the driving force behind the implementation. But what we had to do is realize that this wasn't going to be a quick fix. It wasn't going to be an overnight change because what we were looking at was trying to redesign and develop a culture across an entire school community. And that affected everyone. So I think the process took about 18 months or longer, closer to two years. But what we had to do was make sure that the implementation was effective from, from the get-go. So we treated it almost like um, a long-term goal was that we wanted to remove punishments and sanctions. But And we knew where we wanted to be, but we had to do it in, in small um, bite-sized um, chunks. So we used an initiative process where we designed what we thought might work. We spoke um, very, very regularly daily. Mick will go into this in more detail to the staff, because as he pointed out earlier, you know, it's quite threatening to say, listen, this is what we've done as a society for a very long time since the word go. And what we're going to do is we're going to stop punishing. And people just didn't know what to do. And there was a lot of concern there. But what had been happening was running parallel with this shift in terms of the culture, removing sanctions. We'd also introduced a coaching culture into the school and we'd flatten the hierarchy. So everyone was um, trained to be a coach and we were used to adopting a solution focused approach to everything that we did. This also allowed us to really improve communication and develop a sense of team behind everything. It broke down lots and lots of barriers. We had a really cohesive team and we were all in it together. And then I'll, I'll hand over to you Mick to talk about the implementation and, and how we put that together. Okay, so um, for me, it, it started with trying to influence Steve because he was my boss and although we um, would be on the same page, um, if, he, if he's not on board, then nothing's happening. So starting conversations, um, just conversations in the staff room, conversations with Steve about, look, this isn't working, what can we do? And just letting conversations develop and, and starting to build up some sort of uh, momentum, like get rid of the, the inertia that the, the people are used to, that things can't change. Now, at this point, we didn't have any answers, but the conversations were starting. Then we, we, we met Alice. We got, uh, we got what we needed in, in, terms of, uh, in terms of, first of all, a strategy, and second of all, the, the validity to take it to other people. So, we had a, a compelling argument to, to, to deliver and Alice helped us to do that. She came and talked to our whole staff team, governors, and we'd told them where we wanted to go. It didn't come as a surprise to them. They were terrified in some cases and excited in, in, in other cases. And um, 
Alice came and, and told people exactly why sanctions um, weren't working for us. And very basically, and Alice, please feel free to jump in if, if I mangle, um, mangle the science here. But basically, the, the three main groups of people that, that we, we were dealing with that it wasn't working for were students with callous and emotional traits. And those students just didn't, um, didn't care about the sanctions. They didn't care about the people who were imposing them. They thought that um, actually we were far less important than they were who were we to impose sanctions and it just made them angry to, uh, to a large degree. Students who have a combination of what used to be called SEBD and uh, an ADHD often they don't respond to aversive conditioning because they're not frightened of the punishment and uh, and sometimes their impulsivity um, makes them think makes them laugh before they think anyway. It's not for them. Students with social communication issues um, found it very difficult to pick up the punishment cues and were confused by the whole thing. Sometimes we didn't always um, manage that that well. And when you add that, that those three groups of people together, that's the entire population of our school. And it just wasn't for us. And Alison provided, I've just called you Alison, my goodness. Alice provided us with, with, with with the scientific validity to take people forward and and they were enthused that was the next uh, step the step after that was was designing and we simply had to take the whole team and we spent the next 18 months as a team with a flat hierarchy where everybody's voice mattered um tackling the problems we'd identified one by one and slowly as a team um solving them as we thought and that took about eight months practically every meeting that we had after school uh, on, on a daily basis and, and and we just didn't give up we were terriers with it and eventually as a team um joyously we approached the time when we wanted to, to launch it and we were ready with the system that we thought would work is that about right do you think steve have i missed anything I think that was beautifully articulate, Mick. Well done. Apart from when you you misspoke Alice's name, but I'm sure she'll forgive you. But in in terms of you mentioned counselling, Steve, earlier as when you, you were talking, what other forms of, if you like, professional development did you feel you had to engage the staff in in order to take on what was really a major radical, um change in both thinking as well as behavior of the staff never mind the children so so we use coaching um to, to flatten the hierarchy and develop relationships and when we originally introduced coaching it wasn't in terms of trying to improve pedagogy what we wanted to do is use it as a tool to develop emotional resilience of staff the general resilience promote um emotional awareness, how we impact on other people and really focus on relationships. And then we could use that to model best practice for the students as well. So once we had that in place, I'll, I'll be honest with you, Derek, our schools, um, I know Mick's left us now, um, but our schools are very, very poorly funded um, in terms of the SEND sector. And so we literally have nothing. The secondary school is less than half the minimum recommended size that a special school should be. But what we have is we have a really collegial group of staff. We have a lot of love and we have a real energy and enthusiasm to do this and, and to be, to, like I said earlier, to put the child first and the behavior second. In terms of the additional um, professional development opportunities that we could provide for the staff, we had very little other than what we could persuade Alice to provide for us. So, you know, credit where credit's due. When we talked, and, and Mix mentioned it, talked about that scientific validity, Alice would jump on the train and come up and speak to our staff, speak to our governors. We would unpick that thinking and share our learning. Mick, do you want to jump in as well? Yeah, I, I would turn that question round in many ways because often I would say to, to the team that the answer to our problems lies in the collective wisdom of the group. And we didn't necessarily need to provide them with CPD. What we needed to provide was the opportunity in the forum for them to explore their own ideas. And for them almost, they, they were giving us CPD. The, the, the answers were there already. They knew the students, they knew our school, they knew the system. And um, and people can get hung up on, oh, 
professional development do we need for this? Actually, you need to know your school, you need to know your staff, and you need to exploit their strengths. And, um, and I think that's what we did. Alice. Can I, is it useful for me to give my opinion as an outsider coming into the school? Please. So for, for me coming into to Kilgarth, um, I love going to Kilgarth, um, mainly because they'll always give me chips for lunch. <laughs> but also because it's, because it's an extremely warm and easy place to go to. And I think the most important is I've learned an awful lot about leadership during my time working with Steve and Mick, um, which, you know what, is really handy at the minute when I'm working in my own department that's, that's you know, kind of having to weather all kinds of difficulties and making big decisions about how we run a university department next year. Um, one of the most important things I think is that there's a lot of space in the school for discussion um, and maybe dissent is too strong a word, but, but you know, constructive criticism. Um, there were members of staff that thought what, what was, you know, kind of proposed was a ridiculous idea and was doomed to fail. And none of those voices were shushed. Um, all of them were listened to and all of them were, were made, made to feel just as valid as anyone else's. There's no point running into something like this in a very Pollyanna-ish way, thinking it's going to be marvellous, because then it won't be. Um, and and it's, it's those people that can already identify the areas that, that maybe we haven't thought about that are going to be the most important. So I, I think it's, it's school ethos that, that really drove the ability for lots of these changes to happen. Um, but I, I think some of that is, is exemplified perhaps in the choice of CPD that you did with the school. Can I, can I add to that? I don't want to put you on the spot, Alice, but when we spoke about the, that iterative process and we're constantly reflecting and we do see there are changes as the cohort changes and we think we've got to, we've got to manoeuvre around certain difficulties that we see in the road. So Alice has been with us on that journey throughout and pre-lockdown, you know, you were still a regular visitor up to school but remember I can't remember how long ago it was it was about a year or so ago you were interviewing a few of the staff mm -hmm. and one of them was one of the people who thought that this was going to be particularly challenging do you want to um speak about that um conversation yes I do because he's my favorite um so a member of staff who's quite seen who's who's been there for a long time I think is is the fairest way to start um and was very experienced and very good at what, what he did um, and came from a, a pretty traditional sort of background. Um, and I'm, I'm not really breaking a lot of confidence in telling you this because now he goes and tells people this um, as, as part of what, what he now does. Um, the thing that I think was the most important thing was that when sanctions were removed, and it's worth saying that Kilgarth wasn't very heavy on sanctions anyway, um, but it was a last resort and, and you know, that's, that's always, I think, something that teachers kind of rely on. Um, he said that what happened was that we had de-skilled him, that we had, he had this lovely toolbox of stuff that he knew worked and worked for many years um, and he <coughs> stomped along like some sort of newfangled health and safety executive and told him half of them weren't allowed to work, you know, didn't work anymore. Um, and so he felt de-skilled and he felt, you know, really vulnerable and exposed, I think, in the classroom, because what have you got? If, if your usual last resort is now removed, what, what have you got? And I, I think this is something which a lot of teachers did feel um, and maybe didn't articulate, but he articulated it so beautifully. Um, but this is somebody who, who learned pretty quickly and adapted almost kind of despite what he wanted. Um, and is now, I think, the deputy head. Am I right? No, he's, he is one of the senior teaching staff, though, and he, yep. he has moved into that position on an interim basis. Um, and also now does a decent amount of work with teacher education providers, um, talking about this experience, which I don't think is something that that he was doing beforehand or, or had really considered doing beforehand and honestly it's a complete joy having this conversation with somebody who really thought they knew what they were doing first had this kind of rapid period of of real um uncertainty um and then massive growth 
and seems to be really, really happy in what they're doing now. So, so in fact, switching on, obviously one of the impacts is that staff have changed their approach and their, and their attitude. Uh, there's a comment in there that from somebody who says they ran a primary school without sanctions and it completely works. So if it works, what are the things that you're looking for to see the changes, what examples of changes and impact have you got? And how do you actually, I hate to use the word, but actually measure it in a way that you can then present it to whoever needs to be, um, it, it needs to be presented to Ofsted and, and others to actually show and demonstrate that it's working because it is such a big leap. Mm -hmm. In terms of, of implementation, you've always got to have a measurement framework to make sure that what you're doing is right. So before we break it down, I'd rather flip it on it, the narrative on its head and come at it from the other angle. So, so the ultimate end game, we don't do things for Ofsted, but they come in, they extend equality assure what we're doing. And um, the last two inspections or the last three inspections we've had at, at the secondary school, two at the secondary, one at the primary, have all been um, seen as, as rated out, as outstanding in all areas. Um, everything's been focused on the relationships that we develop according to the reports that have been written about us. We've won multiple national awards and we've been recognised by the DfE as an exemplar in terms of our, our, our support for staff and students and with their mental health and well-being. But obviously that was the end game, but the process to get there was we had to carefully monitor everything that was going on to make sure that this was working. Because the difficulty is it's like a flight path in terms of implementation. If you head off in the wrong direction, if you don't correct that flight path, you're gonna, you're gonna be so far away from your ultimate goal that it's gonna be very difficult to bring it back on track. So we were constantly having open conversations with the staff, with, with, with the students, with families, with everyone who had vested interest in the school to make sure that we were heading in the right direction. Some of those um, experiences, we could use quantifiable data and some of them were around case studies and actually speaking to staff and students and seeing how they felt. I don't know if you wanna jump in there, Mick, as well. Yeah, because there's a couple of points there, okay. and the, the the normal metrics you can you can apply. So um, the, the the number of exclusions, the number of uh, RPIs that we've used, the, the the number of students who are out of lessons at any one time, the number of recorded incidents of um, of negative behaviors and so all, all of those all, all of those figures are useful and um, in a school of our size though. What was important to us, was, uh, I, I don't know, I'd call it the sniff test. You know, you walk down the corridor and you can just tell. You can absolutely, you're just surrounded by, um, by, by warmth and, and calm. And you know what, let me give you an example. When Ofsted showed up for our last inspection, I hope I'm not breaking the confidence for someone here. I had to talk to our caretaker and said, um, can you just make sure those doors are okay? And he interpreted that as, I will paint all of these doors with, um, with, with, with really slow drying paint. So the next day in the tiny corridor, every single door was tacky with gray paint. The kids were coming in coats with 500 quid in some cases they were leaning on them they were putting their hands on the paint the hands were going all over the doors and it was an absolute nightmare yet the offset inspectors didn't notice and and what they did notice was every single instance of a negative choice dealt with calm compassionate uh, manner using help scripts and using the the strategies that we developed and they absolutely I've also got to say when Steve was talking about his flight path it didn't start off like that um, when when we first implemented um, a, a no sanction system it, it worked beautifully because it was novel but there were gaps in the planning like there always are there are things that we didn't anticipate and there are, there are events that, that we didn't foresee and at, I remember sitting in the corridor talking to a child as he's holding of the window to my classroom in his hand and looking around and seeing all sorts of behaviours that um, that it, it was almost like a maelstrom and I didn't 
to do and I could see that staff were stressed and that evening I uh, I almost gave it up. I almost said look let's just stop back to the door and it's funny Alice because the the man you were talking about it was the man who walked into my office right after the after I'd said this to the staff team and basically shook me and said Mick what are you talking to this we've come this far come on let's uh let's let's go through it together and it goes back to to the team that we were talking for we've got a special team of people are killed and that flat structure and the coaching culture and the fact that a ta can tell me what to do on the i will do it and ask them later what the issue was that really helped it being very difficult to get through those tough times without that can I'll, I'll I yeah, sorry. Just before we go into the, the next next sort of question, can can I just say that you know I'm I'm going to be asking for questions from those of you that are listening to this conversation, um, in order to get some of your views into this. So please start using the Q and A if you haven't already used it, and um, with some of your ideas and questions that you want to pose. Um, but while you while you're doing that, can I just ask um, Mick and Steve? Kilgarth is a special place in, in many respects. Um, what are the implications for transferring what you've, you've learned to other sorts of schools, um, other primary schools, larger secondary schools? What are the, the, the sort of guidelines, if you like, that you would be saying to people, these are things that you need to be working on? Shall I start with that, Mick? Please, yeah. Um, so, you know, there are a couple of really interesting pieces of, of free material that you can look at. So first and foremost, I'd certainly recommend having a look at the EEF um, report on how to improve behaviour in schools. And, you know, there are a number of strategies that they suggest or pillars or foundational things that you need to have in place to do that. But underpinning everything is consistency. Um, uh, so I'd, I'd certainly recommend looking at that report. Now, that came about, obviously, um, about 18 months ago, um, which was after we had had um, implemented our approach. Um, the other thing that I'd suggest is looking at how you go about your implementation strategy. So plan it, because other people have tried to do something similar, but they've just done it by creating a plan on the back of a fag packet and gone for it overnight. And, you know, I think we've, we've highlighted that we thought about this for a very long time. It was driven, we used various theoretical models to support us, such as Carter's eight-step cycle to change a, a culture. We had support, which was um, absolutely needed and absolutely stunning from Alice, um, who came in and gave us that scientific validity and helped us um, to approach it um, with the right methodology. Um, I'd say it's absolutely um, transferable to other schools. Mick and I were asked a few years ago to write an online behaviour management course for a charity, which we did. And it was a five week course, but we said we'll do it. But we want to do it around this non-confrontational approach. And when the course was launched, it, it's no longer running. Um, Mick and I are hoping to resurrect it next year. But when it was launched, we had 10,000 subscribers from 165 countries. So there's certainly um, there's certainly a willingness to to look at this approach and, and you know there's a there's a key drive there that people want to be more compassionate, um, and the other thing I'd say is that you can replicate what we've done, and Mick and I have spent a lot of time in other schools. We've literally trained thousands of other school staff, but we've worked in other arenas as well. We've worked with prison governors, we've worked with the probation service, we've worked with police, and at the moment. Um, while well, Mick's gone on to pass this new, um, I have as well, in a way. So I'm currently seconded to lead a place-based change initiative to transform a community in Merseyside. And Alice and I are currently working on a theoretical framework to try and create a public health model to tackle all forms of antisocial behaviour, right away from your day-to-day antisocial behaviour in the streets through to acquisitive crime and, um, and right-wing terrorism. So we are adopting this approach and, and this implementation framework. It seems quite, um, quite a leap of faith, but actually what we're trying to do 
is as we started off the conversation saying we're trying to stop being reactive and be more proactive and adopt a real um, fo sharp focus on early intervention because it's far more effective than remedial action. And I'll stop speaking now because I think you were going to jump in as well, Mick. Yeah, I, someone might want to ask about it later. I would say we, we, we've we shown in, in some ways that it, that it can work. We're, we're quite, quite evangelical about this. When we were given the opportunity to take over a pupil referral unit and for one reason or other financially, it, it, it had to fold in the end. If, if you looked at its Ofsted report, it, it reads like a, a tabloid um, newspaper. It talks about tsunami of incidents and kids, kids under siege and staff, staff in fear. And in two months, this approach just turned it around, I feel. And and the, 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 the metrics were, were measurable. I could talk about those. I, I've moved to a different setting. And part of the reason is that we couldn't expand the Kilgarth uh, to take this approach further. And the things I want to do is just is 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 take it further. In answer to your original question, what are the general general um, bits of advice? I think, Derek, to to take this forward. I would say first of all, um, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be conceited enough to say that we know how to make it work in other schools. One, know your school, know what you want, and know what your students are like. Number two, um, the thing that does work for everybody, which we haven't even touched upon yet, is reward or, or the promise of reward or the possibility of reward. It's massively powerful, whether it be praise or tokens. So get your system right and make sure that the, the um, your interval between behaviour and whatever that might be is really short. I would say that. And finally, I would say the most important thing is get your governors on board because if they believe and they hold their nerve, then 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 the ice that you're walking on is thick. If if they don't, if they walk, then then and uh, it's really difficult to uh, to take this sort of initiative further. You, you mentioned rewards there, Mick, and I've, there's one of the questions on the, on the board saying, what are the alternatives this, to the sanctions? Um, okay. So can, can you perhaps, I, either of you, go into a bit more detail about some of the alternatives and ways in which you can address the behaviour issue as a, an alternative to the sanctions? They mentioned um, conversation frameworks and things like that. C can you just sort of give us some more examples of those? Yeah, who's going to speak, guys? Alice, were you going to speak then? I don't mind. Do you want to answer this question? Then I'll. I've. I've okay. got. I've got a sort of question that I think might be interesting for you two as well. Okay, Steve, is this me again? I always like listening to you, Mick. So please plow on. Okay, so um, so the the. the there are three aspects to, to, to the way to work for us. One is curriculum modification to yet yeah, to, in order to, to make it more engaging, to make sure the students have got a diet of things that um, that that is better than, than, than the alternative, that is, is better than making negative behaviour choices. So curriculum modification in terms of quality, can, can curriculum modification in terms of content, in terms of teaching pro-social behaviours, in terms of teaching how to build a relationship, in terms of teaching students what we're actually doing and, and being uh, being open with them. They can finish our sentences for us and our scripts because we, we tell them what we're saying and why we're going to say it and, and they react really well. So that's one aspect. Aspect. The other aspect is, is intervention. So when you identify um, a, a particular student with a particular issue, no matter what that be, um, make sure you've got the um, the capacity to intervene in some way. Now at Kilgarth, we are so limited in terms of what we can do because of, of the finances of the school. And basically, we had to just scratch around and invent those interventions ourselves and fit them in wherever we could but they're important and they work even if it's just a conversation on the corridor that so interventions are important the most important is 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 to make sure that behaviors are immediately rewarded the systems in your brain which respond to rewards are, are massively massively powerful and um, and whether that reward is praise or whether that is a trip or activity or 
or even a raffle ticket that might get you a prize doesn't really matter the the reward and the prospect of reward is there and it's got to be immediate so we've got levels of, of rewards students get marks for efforts because efforts more achievement and for behavioral choices in in lessons and they get a mark from one to five and i'm assuming this hasn't changed too much steve since uh, since i've moved on and that's what we do here now and um, so students are marked and as the as the lesson progresses they can predict their own marks because there should be constant dialogue between the students and the teacher using keywords for example perfect means five excellent for good means three and everything's predicated around being good and uh, so the students can predict what marks they're earning and if if there's an issue the teacher can then uh, use scripts like well so far you're making some good choices and that's a two uh, to, to make that to make that uh, good this is what we'd have to do so instead of describing negative behaviors you're describing the positive choices that need to be made in order to, in, in order to earn rewards, as soon as, as soon as a positive choice is made, then it's explicitly praised and absolutely described. So you describe the behaviour and praise. So you get an immediate reward there. Reward at the end of the lesson, at the end of the day, quickly average your scores. If you have uh, earned an average of three for both of those uh, aspects, behaviour and effort, then you get to do an activity that you enjoy. If not, then there's a timetabled lesson that you go to because you haven't earned, earned the reward time. So it's not a punishment, it's just, okay, this, this is your lesson you, because you, you, you haven't earned the reward because your behaviours over the course of the day haven't been good. And it's got the, 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 the beauty of being able to, a child being able to have a really rotten morning and it's the day's not written off for them. Then they, there's, there's, there's a possibility of improvement and redemption, and still reward at the end of the day. It's, it's still hanging over them all the time, like an, an inverted sort of Damocles, if that makes any sense. Steve, are you going to speak? No, I, w I was just really impressed with what you were saying. Um, yeah. Uh, no, I'll I'll hand over to Alice. That was beautiful, Mick. Honestly. Thank you. When you were talking, I was thinking about, and also looking in, in, in the um, chat at some of the questions, why this approach works so beautifully in, in, um, in Kilgarth and in Gilbrook and, and also in, in the other um, SEMH primary setting that I've worked at previously. Um, and why mainstream schools aren't picking this up with, you know, open arms and joy. And I'm, what, I, what I think is, is that if you're in an SEMH setting, if you're in a special setting, you've got a little bit more freedom and a, to be a bit more creative, maybe because the expectations about outcomes are lower from, from most quarters, you know, Ofsted don't have perhaps enormous expectations about, about you know, kind of academic outcomes um, or behavior and always extremely sort of pleasantly surprised when they see how, how functional things are. And I think, also means for you, the majority of your students needed this change, right? Whereas in mainstream school, it's going to be a significant and important minority of students that need this change. And in some of those mainstream settings, the focus is on maneuvering those students elsewhere, perhaps, um, or, or otherwise sort of containing them within the existing system rather than flexing the system or, or changing the system because it's true that that you know most of us just have internalized how to behave right i don't i don't you know not commit crimes because i'm frightened of prison i don't commit crimes because well i know how to behave in polite society um and i think that's true for most children at school but what you've needed to do is, is skills build and demonstrate to your students that, that it's worth their while playing the game and it's worth their while being pro-social and looking at other people and thinking about other people's emotional states and their own because that wasn't that wasn't something they'd come with and so and so I think when we look at kind of shifting this out into more mainstream settings you know big mainstream secondary school it feels like a very big risk to take on something like this um, when when the message that you know kind of 
low tolerance approaches are are you know good and sanctioned by by you know DFE and, and, and others is is a very strong message. So I'm I'm sympathetic to to schools feeling that it's a very risky thing to do. I know it can work, um, but I wondered what you thought about that. It looks yeah, like you're looking right. directly at us, Alice. Steve, yeah. you can go first. Yeah, I was gonna say you're absolutely right. Uh, when I had this utopian vision of coming in, you know, post genocide and trying to change society one child at a time. Um, I remember distinctly going into a, a mainstream school. So I worked as a Senko, I've been an Ofsted inspector, I've worked in Prus, I've worked in SMA settings, but I remember specifically one moment in the mainstream school um, where there was a teacher had taken a child out of the class and was screaming at him so loudly he was spitting in his face. And a part of me died that day and I just thought, where do you get to? to manage behavior. So we talk about modern, modifying behavior over the long term. I can manage the behavior in my primary school anytime I want. I can walk in, I'm a big, horrible, ugly, scary scouser, and I can scream at them. Is that the right thing to, know, to do? Absolutely not. And what we're trying to do is look at the underlying causes of, that, of those behaviors and address them and focus on developing pro-social behaviors as opposed to tackling the antisocial behaviors. But you're absolutely right. For our schools and our settings and where Mick is now as well, the significant majority, the majority, all of the children, all, it, all. punishment doesn't work. But in mainstream, the, the, it's a significant minority. But still, does a punitive approach, is it morally right? Let's be honest, though. What we're not saying is remove consequences. There need to be consequences for your actions. There are consequences in our schools. What we're saying now is that punitive approach isn't the right approach. And if we can do away with it, the better. We need to, there's a lot of talk around trauma-informed practice and trauma-informed approaches and adverse childhood experiences. We need to be aware of that and understand actually what is driving those behaviours particularly for the most vulnerable members of our communities. Do you want to come in, Mick? Yeah, please. Um, so, yeah, you're right, Alice. We, we've got it easy because when I went to my chair of governors and said, can I ignore Progress 8, please, when that first came out, it, because it shouldn't apply to us, the answer was yes. Um, once I explained to, to, to the governing body why um, we should do that, the, the answer was yes. There aren't many governing bodies in, in a secondary mainstream school that would say yes to in answer to that question. When I said, um, and, and, and Steve came on board with me, can we remove sanctions? They said yes, um, because it, it didn't work for us. And it's hard, it, it was really scary. We went through pain and I, I was, like I said, evangelical about it, but we still went through pain and I still found it scary. And I walked away after the first day thinking, I wonder if I've actually destroyed my school two years will tell and um and, and so it, it, it's terrifying in many ways and and to make it work and it can work people have a got to want it to happen and um and you're steve's right when he says child by child because school by school teacher by teacher leadership team by leadership team you you have to overcome some inertia and some momentum you're right when you say it comes from politicians because you have to overcome that massive barrier and the barrier of God knows how many thousand years of, of practice across cultures across the world. Um, and then once you decide to do it and get over that fear, then it's really hard and it takes an awful lot of thinking about and it takes an awful lot. And um, and there's the last hurdle to overcome. So I believe could do and I'd love to work with uh, in a mainstream setting to try and make it work but I don't know how many mainstream head teachers would come in Steve, and hold my hand. Look, looking at the questions Steve can you expand a little bit on the difference between sanctions and consequences so what the two or three questions have come in they picked that up about consequences what do you mean how are they different from sanctions? 
So the consequences, um, you know, whatever you do in life, whatever decision you make, there's going to be a consequence for that decision. Now, if you look at the dictionary definition of a sanction, it's the threat of a punishment for disobeying a rule. And that's what we're trying to remove to move away from. So, for example, if someone is destroying a classroom or, or, you know, swearing and disrupting learning, we're not punishing them by saying, listen, you can't be in the room anymore. We will have a, a conversation with them and remove them from that environment so everyone else's learning can continue. What we're not doing is relying on punishment. So we are not sending children out to write lines at the end of the day, giving them detentions where they have to do um um, different sanctions, um, cleaning a classroom, picking up crisp packets on, on the on the schoolyard. What we're doing is we're saying we are a school and we do have high standards and there will be consequences. We want you to learn. We're not a youth club. You don't come here and just play pool or kick a football about. You're here to be in your lessons. If you choose not to study maths, what we've done is we've extended the school day slightly and We'll say to them, listen, if you are working hard and you you um, are engaging with the curriculum, you're trying, uh, you're behaving, you go home at a set time. If you don't, you just, or you will earn a reward. If you don't, you get, you're choosing the natural consequences. You're choosing to repeat that lesson later. So we're not making them do something that is completely, um, distant from what we expect in the classroom they have to actually do the work that we were expecting them to um, complete in the maths lesson with the with the maths teacher, that, Mick? yeah, yeah with, the, uh, with that person so and, and it's, it, it's not time bound for me sanctions are are things that an institution imposes because it's convenient and it's organizationally and structurally uh, easy to administer um in, in the example that steve has just given um we would personalize um uh, an, an approach so if a student for example has decided to sit on the corridor instead of going to the maths the first approach we would have is okay is there a, a good reason for this are they threatened by the work can they do it have they had an awful time at home is there something in the background driving that behavior if there is and if it's reasonable then we deal with that if, if they just can't be bothered, and sometimes, let's face it, kids just can't be bothered, sometimes they just make choices because, um, because they do, um, then we'll say to them, look, you've got an obligation to, to educate, you can't, we can't choose to not have an education because then we're failing to do it so that that learning isn't going to go away that learning needs to be done so we'll just arrange a different time to do it with you and it's not time bound they if they've missed a, a lesson they don't do another hour after school what they do is get that learning done and then and, and that could be after 10 minutes because they do it on to one basis and what they've learned then is a that that learning is important b that um that we are not going to give up on them and, and see that we care about them so much that we're individualizing the approach. And in, in terms of consequences, okay, there's, there's a book um, uh, I've talked to today who's pathologically demand avoidant and sanctions aren't going to work for him. And if I say stay behind after school or do this or do that, he's going to look me in the face and say no. And there is no way he's budget. If we personalise it and have a conversation and say, do you know what you did, you actually broke a window, has had this impact on this person and my site manager now has to fix it. And as long as the, the, the person's not callous and emotional, as, as Alice will tell us, then if he cares about people, he can say, what's fair? What would be fair to happen now? Or I'll help sir to, to, to do some work. Okay, fantastic, let's go. And... Um, and that he's learned something from that as well. That's the difference for me between a sanction and a consequence. Again, just looking at the, the sort of questions that are there, a lot of it is about changing staff's attitudes as much as children. Um, so is this something that in some ways actually said, highlighted a book apparently about, you know, changing adults changes everyone. Whether you know the book or not doesn't matter, but I think the principle is there. Um, mm. Have you got any advice on how to do it? Again, picking up one of the things that I think you said, Mick, you know, the 
people working within the SEN world seem to be able to bring about some of these changes. But once you go beyond that into probably what is the other parts of the school, people are more reluctant and they resort back to tried and tested methods, whatever that means. Um, how do you change those attitudes, I think, is probably a last thought coming from everybody. I've got one more question I'm going to ask you all before we do wrap it up. But just that one, I think, because it seems to be at the heart of it. You know, I can talk forever, Steve. Do you want to have a go? Uh, I was going to make I was going to make two comments. One, um, Mick and I both know Paul Dix, who wrote the book. Um, I know there's only four of us in the room, so don't tell him I've not actually read it. But I understand the premise behind it, which is all about self-reflection and understanding how your own actions impact on the children. And you know, it, there's some sound advice in there. The other suggestion I was going to make. Mick, I don't know if you'll agree, is I, if I shared my screen for one minute, we could talk about Cotter and about changing changing that culture and how we went about it using that iterative process and getting some key people on board initially. Yeah, go on. And then um, if you I have two minutes when you finish. Screen. Or you start. And then, okay. And then okay then then. For me, there's part of the answer that, that I like and part of the answer that I don't like. Here's the bit that I like. The bit that I like is if you get the right culture in your staff team. We've got a culture where if I um, walk down the corridor and, and, you know, sometimes I can be a bit maverick and gung-ho and, uh, and, and step outside protocols. And if I do, a, a teaching assistant or a teacher or the caretaker will say to me, Mick, that's not what we agreed. And I, I will wind my neck in. If you can get that culture where people will question each other's um, question each other's actions and then actually um, do something about it and it's acceptable for people to have what I call a developmental conversation um, and, and 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 be open with each other that's that's really key and I would say also don't give up just keep on hammering it keep on hammering the, the science behind it this is why we're doing it this is why we're doing it and look at the results we've achieved Steve will talk about that in a second I'm sure look at what we've done um it's worth it it's worth carrying on then that drive and you can probably tell that I get quite passionate about it. That The passion is necessary uh, because you've got to pull reluctant people with you. And the bit of the answer that I don't like is that um, is actually how much do you care about your kids? Um, they've got one chance at it. If you believe you're doing is right and you think someone is not going to change and you think someone is going to destructive then I would use the processes at my disposal to either improve them and um, and help them to develop or to help them out of the organization because as far as I'm concerned there's no place for someone who's being destructive and it's really hard because we're naturally optimistic and we do fall back on things that are tried and tested as Derek said because um because they've kept us alive this far, why shouldn't they keep us alive um, for, for the next 10 years? You know, that's that's the way that we're programmed, that the change comes from um, passion, um, strong and, um, and, and informed leaders. Steve, do you want to pick up the diagram? Yeah, I'll finish off. So this, this approach was, was um, developed by Cotter and he, he talks about the eight step cycle to, to implement change in, in any culture or environment. And we did it slightly differently because number three about creating a strategic vision. And um, that actually, we began with that because as well as introducing a coaching culture, we just redeveloped our entire raison d'etre as a school. So we invited everyone to be involved in this, students, all staff, governors, any stakeholder, the local police, the, the priest of the church across the road, um, speech and language therapists, clinical psychologists, educational psychologists, everyone. And we recreated our mission statement, our vision and our values. So every decision we made, we could refer back to that overarching vision. Why are we here? What are we here to do? And during that process, we decided to take a holistic approach to developing the children. So we had our sense of urgency, number three, the strategic vision. And then Mick's spoken, um, you know, really eloquently about developing that guiding coalition, making sure I was on board with everything, making sure some key members of staff. And then once we started to do that, we removed the barriers 
the key barriers we had were around people saying, well, wow, what am I going to do if someone tells me to F off or someone throws it? What do I do when this happens? And that took us a long time. And Alice played a, a key, key pivotal role in helping us remove those barriers and see that there's another way. So once we had the platform to develop, we then started to generate short term wins. And as Mick said, we built momentum by reporting back regularly on, on the quantifiable stuff. So on, on exclusion data, mislearning data, um, attendance data, and also some of the qualitative stuff. So we were asking people, how do you feel? You know, what's your well-being levels like? And, and the students and the teachers, you could see well-being develop. We continued with that. And then the change started to take place. But, you know, talking about the flight paths again, there were some um, bear traps and pitfalls along the way. We identified them and then we came back and we started to change it again. And, and you know, I'll just put up one last slide. There, there's some quotes that we've taken from our last two Ofsted reports. And you can see that, you know, there's high morale, exceptional atmosphere. And um, I think two of the key ones that I'll point you to are on the left. So we remove sanctions because we wanted to remove threat. And it clearly says Ofsted felt that we go to great lengths to understand what be causing what might be causing worry or anxieties for our pupils. And the top left sums it all up. Relationships are absolutely key to our success at Kilgarth. And that's not just relationships with the students, it's with each other. So we've created this collegial team who are really, really trying to do things um, a little bit radically. And we want to be a little bit different so we can get the best outcomes for our pupils. Thanks, Steve. Can, can I, um, so we're coming to 10 past five and we said we'd be finished by quarter past. So um, can I just ask you all the same question, basically, um, probably starting with, with Alice, I think. So Alice, be ready. Um, if you wanted to give everybody a single piece of advice, what would that be um, in, in order to A, start on this journey and B, make it a success? Um, I think it would be to look at the relationships in the school and to make sure that teachers especially are in a space that they can make relationships. Very stressed teachers can't build good relationships with each other or with students. So there needs to be, I think, a real focus on staff before you focus on the students. You need to bring your staff on board first. Um, and some of that needs to be about making sure that their working lives are, are in a space where they can manage change. Because I don't, I don't think it's possible to take it on otherwise. And to make sure they feel supported during the change. I, I read a little bit in the comment box about, you know, kind of local authorities suggesting that this, this was a thing to do. I don't think you can buy everyone a copy of a book and, and expect change to happen. Um, unless obviously it's Stephen Mick's book. Um, <laughs> I think I, it really needs to be a properly thought out approach um, that, that does take into account all the ways that it might not work in your particular setting. Mick? Okay, um, it's related to what Alice has just said, really. What Steve described um, as um, it, it, it was our stakeholder day, we called it, where we came together as an extended team and decided what our, our mission and our values were. It was massively important and, uh, and everything we've done since that's been successful has built from that. Our first value that we developed as a staff team, for example, was relationships come first. And we've, we, we refer back to that every decision that we make. So that's that would be one piece of advice. Get, get your staff team to be heading in the same direction, however you manage it. The second bit was find your Alice. Um, what I mean by that is um, you can't do it alone. You can't do it by yourself. You, you're going to need some support and some, uh, some access to research. And we would have found it impossible without that. Steve? You know, I echo everything Alice and Mick have said. Um, well-being is absolutely crucial. Relationships are absolutely crucial. And you can only develop effective relationships through having good lines of communication between each other. And the coaching was was really useful for that. Um, if I was going to give one additional piece of advice, it would be to look at the overarching um, implementation framework that you're trying to do. Alice, you know, Alice, as Alice said, 
training is fantastic, but it's going to fall flat if you're not doing the training for a specific purpose. You need to be able to measure what you're um, what you're doing so you can see whether it's effective and whether that intervention is working. So I'd, I'd certainly recommend looking at the EEF implementation framework, their, their report looking at um, improving behaviour in schools and as Mick said, use a research informed approach and find your own Alice. Thank you very much for um, all of that, all three of you. Are. Um, it, it seems to me that what we've tried to do tonight is to actually say we've got some of the research which tells us and points us in a particular direction. We've got our own experience which we can build on and we've also got our expertise. But actually moving forward to implement that is one of the biggest challenges um, we face and that involves getting our colleagues on board as well but not by imposing it but by listening to them and working with them and sharing some of the ideas so with that can I say formally to Steve and to Mick and to Alice thank you for coming along and sharing those ideas with us tonight and can I say thank you to all of those of you who have stuck with us for the hour and a quarter um, I hope you found it very interesting and more than that useful and that you're hopefully going to go back into your own schools and try to work towards um, an improvement for everybody in this particular way. So with that, thank you very much indeed. Oh, sorry, the last final thing to, I must remember is that this has been recorded um, and it will be on the uh, Learners website. So if you want to go back and listen to some of the things that were said, then you're welcome to do so. Thank you very much indeed to everybody. Bye. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thank you.